It is pretty safe to say that geometry is important to architecture. There's clearly some advanced geometric operations going on in some of architecture's complicated shapes, or at the very least in the calculation of structural forces. And then there's all those shows on PBS and the Discovery Channel which claim to uncover secret messages encoded in the shapes of ancient buildings. In this video, we'll expose the mystery as we take a closer look at how and the why that architects use geometry in the design of buildings. Stay tuned. <laughs> Hello, my name is Stuart Hicks, and I teach design studios and lecture courses at the University of Illinois in Chicago. For me, geometry is one of those things that sneaks up on me. Like, I know a task that I'm working on requires some complicated geometric manipulation, but it tends to operate at a relatively intuitive level in ways that are sort of baked into the tools that I'm using, like the modeling, the drafting, or the rendering software. When I started school, I was asked to purchase these like green plastic triangles, uh, a drafting uh, pencil, and a compass compass and a, a straight edge parallel rule and I was told that these tools could help me draw the world that I'd be designing. Parallel and perpendicular lines and circles are really powerful tools in mapping coordinates from the real world onto a flat sheet of paper. Then we learned drafting on a computer, which at first included programs like early versions of AutoCAD, which tried to digitally mimic the procedures of drafting by hand. The digital drafting skills that I learned in school landed me my first job while I was still in school of drawing land surveys. Surveyors use all sorts of interesting and, and purpose-built tools to accurately measure the size of objects and where they're located on the earth. Then geometry is an important component of making sense of these measurements, like triangulation that measures the angles of a triangle formed by three survey control points. The invention of geometry is usually credited to the ancient Greeks, specifically Euclid, who developed its fundamental principles in order to measure the size, the shape, and the relative positions of figures on the Earth's surface. So basically surveying. The word geometry itself comes from two roots, geo meaning earth, and metri meaning measure. Euclid is often also depicted holding the same tools that I was told to purchase from before, a compass, a straight edge, and a pencil of some sort. There's a kind of resonance in the fact that the same tools for surveying and measuring the world as it is are also the same tools one uses to draw and design how the world could be through architecture. The theorist Robin Evans was fascinated by this concept, and he wrote books like Translations from Drawings to Buildings. He closely studied the idea of projection, which are geometric rules and procedures for translating the complicated three-dimensional realities of the material world to the flat, delineated world of drawings. Of course, it goes in other directions too, and we can project the flat world of the drawings into the three-dimensionality of the real world. This sounds a lot like architecture, and at least part of the process sounds like architecture, because Robin Evans famously said that architects do not make buildings, they make drawings and models of buildings. There's a distance between architects and the product of their labor. Directly, they make drawings, but then those drawings are merely instruments in the construction of a building. They're not really the ends in and of themselves. The world is constantly going through this passage between 3D real physical space and 2D drawing in the creation of the built environment. And that translation process leaves traces on the things that we build. We draw things in a certain way based on the tools that we have, which have inherent biases. You know, they're good at certain things and not good at others and why we can only really build what we can imagine and draw. Geometry's importance to architecture is delineated even within the very first book on architecture that we've ever discovered, De Architectura, written by Vitruvius, the Roman architect and writer. And it's here that he famously claimed that buildings that are good hath three conditions, commodity, firmness, and delight. Commodity is the ability of a building to accommodate its use. Firmness is the ability of the building to stand up and delight is the ability of the building to lift up the human spirit. Geometry is one of the primary keys to achieve all three of these conditions, and is this one of the most important skills that an architect should possess, at least according to Vitruvius. The first two conditions, commodity and firmness, are pretty objective, and it's clear how geometry can aid in their task. But delight, on the other hand, seems a little bit more difficult to quantify. But Vitruvius believed that the path to delight was to create structures that connected with nature and geometry was a primary tool for understanding nature's constructions, and with it we were able to understand things like symmetry and the relative proportions between things and their parts. 
Of course, humans are the greatest creations within nature, and any guiding geometric principles present in humans should also be true for our greatest artistic creations. The Vitruvian Man is the famous drawing by Leonardo da Vinci, attempting to figure out how the human form can be simultaneously inscribed within a square and within a circle. One question I would ask in this process is geometry can be used to describe the human form, but is the human form actually born from geometric principles? Certain conceptions of God from history depict a great architect of the universe, using the tools of the geometer and of the architect, creating the universe or earth with geometric precision. Fast forwarding to architects like Alberti, a Renaissance era architect in Italy, and expressing geometric principles architecturally was still of great importance. Designs like his facade addition to the Santa Maria Novella in Florence is treated like an essay in whole number ratios. Alberti believed geometric principles governed nature and all of art. Evidence could be found in music, an art form where proportions are inarguably an important factor. Stringed instruments, for instance, behave in very precise ways, like when you hold a string at its halfway point, it resonates at a frequency one octave higher. But Alberti didn't believe that the importance of geometry flowed from music to architecture. Rather, this kind of geometry is a guiding force within all of the high arts. Alberti is also the person credited with conceiving the role of the architect as a person separate from a builder or a carpenter. He wanted to raise the status of architecture to be on par with the other fine arts, and it was important to distinguish the person who knew the buildings through study, the intellect, and thus geometry, rather than through their hands in construction. His theory about geometry and its role in architecture was important for staging it as a high art. Alberti's geometries were largely governed by whole numbers, but one of the most peculiar and important proportional conditions occurs when something is 1.61 to 1. This ratio is called the golden ratio, I kid you not, and it can be constructed geometrically through a simple set of translations. First, you draw a square by drawing a horizontal line intersected with a perpendicular one. It doesn't matter where they cross. Then you use a compass to find equidistant points on each line. You finish the square by drawing perpendicular lines through these points. Then divide the square in half, and you can find the halfway point by drawing diagonals between the four corners. Then you draw a line from one half segment to the corner of the square. You swing that length down and then create a rectangle from the new length. This golden shape can be drawn without using any numbers or any predetermined lengths, and it has a number of really interesting properties. One is that it can be continuously subdivided into squares and into new golden rectangles. When traced, a very particular shape of spiral emerges that can be found all across nature in things like shells and in seed growth. And it turns out that this ratio develops directly as a result of growth. So it is related to the Fibonacci sequence. You know, when you add the previous two numbers to get the next one, as in the sequence of 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, as you get higher in the sequence, the ratio between the adjacent numbers approach 1.61 to 1. Plants and crustaceans, they don't know the Fibonacci sequence. They just grow that way because that's the most efficient growth pattern over time. We developed geometry specifically to describe this kind of stuff, and sometimes it's pretty good at it. Geometry is like a language that is particularly good at certain aspects of translating between the physical world and its representation in drawing. Calling it a language is also particularly apt because, in fact, geometric constructions are actually best described through words. For instance, the definition of a circle is the most precise circle there is. No drawing of a circle can approach its perfection, and certainly no physical circle made in nature or by humans are actually perfect. Circles don't exist in nature, folks. The sun? No. Planets? Not quite. Circles are perfect, and nothing perfect exists in nature. Even planets are oblong spheroids. The geometric base unit of an ancient building was the column. All the parts of the column have a proper proportional relationship between them. Then the building as a whole is usually some multiple of column diameters as well. And this unit of measurement will govern the building's major and minor dimensions. 
The concept that geometry is like a language is also helpful in thinking about its role in communicating architectural ideas just in general. Buildings are immobile, and architecture has always relied on media to proliferate its ideas. So not only are architects distanced from actual buildings in their construction and use drawing as a medium between them, often other people are trying to talk about or describe buildings and find themselves at a distance from them as well. So if someone wanted to describe the proper method of designing a building or to tell others about a grand structure, to those that can't visit it, the building needs to be immortalized in something like a book. Before the printing press, books were copied by hand, and authors couldn't rely on the fallible drawing skills of those that were copying them. So they used simple verbal geometric descriptions to accurately convey the relationships between the parts. However, even after the printing press and after Industrial Revolution, geometry has remained a, a driving fascination for a number of different architects. Le Corbusier, for instance, was a particularly media-savvy architect who invented an entirely comprehensive geometric system that he called Le Mojolor and he used it in the design of buildings like Unité de Habitation. If you haven't watched my video on Le Corbusier's free plans, uh, feel free to check it out in one of the corners. The modular man is uh, segmented according to the golden ratio, of a, so the ratio of the total height of the figure to the height of the figure's navel is 1.61. These proportions then can be scaled up or down infinitely using a Fibonacci progression. The modular was meant to be a kind of universal system of proportions this way, and it could be used to provide measurements for all sorts of things from designing of door handles to entire cities. And Le Corbusier believed that it could be further applied to industry and mechanics, not just for architecture. This system won widespread praise, but was not really adopted because Le Corbusier wanted to patent the system and to earn royalties from buildings that would use it. The fundamental module of the modulor is a six-foot man, allegedly based on the usual height of the detectives in English crime novels that Corbusier enjoyed. Ultimately, the starting point is completely arbitrary, and if anything, the system is inherently not inclusive due to its privileging of a slightly above average height white male as a base unit. So I've talked about geometry relating buildings to nature, and we've talked about buildings to human bodies, but geometry is also good at relating buildings to other buildings. My second video was about the nine square grid in architecture, which is the geometric breakdown of buildings as a means to study and compare their underlying geometric makeup. If you haven't watched that one yet, I also suggest that you give that one a go. Geometry is abstract, and architects can copy or improvise on certain underlying geometric constructs without copying every detail of a building. Using geometry, architects can build on the work that came before them, learning from previous works and building on their conceptual foundation. Architects are asked to sit down at an empty piece of paper with the tools of a geometer and draw buildings. Often they'll start with shapes that are particularly useful and have multiple reasons for being, whether they believe they resonate with nature in the way that Vitruvius did or not. For some architects, buildings should explicitly express geometric principles, and for others this might be less important than other guiding interests. Architects like Boulay, for instance, designed vast buildings from a simple, single geometric shape like a sphere. His student, Ledoux, subsequently designed an ideal house, a house in the shape of a sphere its ideality coming from its resonance with a simple and universal geometric rules, not necessarily because it's the ideal shape for human occupation. Other architects might venture to create as complicated a building as possible, so as to show their command and mastery of the latest tools which allow them to bend geometry at their will. In this kind of architecture, everything is particular, with a unique shape. Everything presents a problem to solve, and the building bears the expression of the difficulties and the mastery of geometry. But even today, architects design houses in the simple shapes of circles as a way of creating an architecture that isn't born from the desire to showcase geometric complexity. Rather, the simple shapes allows others to see the ease with which buildings can be composed and allow the people to experience a building to decide whether the circle is there to reference the roundness of the earth, the circle of life, the spherical house of Ledoux, or if it's just a circle. And that's where I think geometry finds a sweet spot in architecture. It's a tool to be used, and the kinds of expression it can find in a building can remain abstract and buried enough so as to create a productive level of ambiguity. Extremely complex geometric actions are being performed seamlessly within the tools of the architect, but its expression, like song lyrics or a poem, can have multiple interpretations and levels of depth. 
where I think it goes off the rails is when things are made complicated just for the sake of it, or people forget that geometry is an invention we use to describe things, and we shouldn't be so surprised when it aligns well with the stuff that was born from it in the first place. That's it for my hot take on geometry. Tune in every week for some more hot takes on other aspects of uh, architecture and the built environment. See you around.